Hello. I don't know how well you can see me in the video. I hope you can see me well enough. You should be able to read this, though, and it's on the sheet that is posted to the website as well, so make sure that you print that out or at least have it uh, in front of you or maybe do two windows and have this video on one side and this sheet on the other. Um, have these together in some way so that we you can follow along with this. But uh, we're going to go through this uh, the notes for Chapter 25. Um, the reason for this is that in class we didn't quite finish and since I'm not going to be in school on Tuesday, on Tuesday, it's important for you to be able to get these notes. So if you weren't here or if you were here but you didn't get to finish it, we're going to go through the notes here. If you were here, the first part of this will be as we did. So to read this, hopefully you can read it, uh, hopefully, but we'll see. One indicator of physical fitness is resting pulse rate. Ten men volunteered to test an exercise device advertised on TV by using it three times a week for 20 minutes. Their resting pulse rates in beats per minute were measured before the test began and then again after six weeks. Results are shown here. Is there evidence that this kind of exercise can reduce resting pulse rates and by how much? Now, we cannot use a two-sample t-test for these data. We talked about why in class. The reason why is because these lists of numbers are not independent. They fail the independent samples condition. We would not be able to use a two-sample t-test because the independent samples condition would fail. The reason for that is because Alan here, having a resting pulse rate of 30, uh, 73 before and 73 after, or Brandon having 83 before 79 after, a person with a higher pulse rate beforehand is going to have a higher pulse rate after. The after pulse rates depend in part on their before. These are not completely independent random numbers. And so we can't use the independent samples condition to talk about these. We're not going to conduct a test. We're not going to do inference about the difference of the means. What we're going to do is a test for the mean of the differences. So 73 to 73, that's a difference of 0. 83 to 79, that's down 4. 85 to 81 is down 4. 87 to 86, minus 1. 91 to 87, minus 4. 99 to 91, minus 8. 87 to 84 is minus 3. Minus 2, plus 1, and minus 3 for Jorge. These are the numbers that we're going to be using doing a hypothesis test on. Now, the short version of this explanation is that the actual mechanics of the hypothesis test will be exactly the same for this test as they are for a one-sample t-test, the only difference being that this are, these are the numbers that we'll be using. We're going to be running a one-sample t-test on these data here. So these are the data, these are the numbers that we'll use uh, to, to do our hypothesis test. So, hypotheses. What are the hypotheses? The null hypothesis here is going to be that the exercise machine, the exercise machine does not reduce pulse rates. In symbols, what this means is that the average of the difference this is the important part, the average of the difference. So if everybody in the entire world used this exercise device in exactly the same way, and we measured the resting pulse rates before and the resting pulse rates after, this would be the average of those differences. So the average difference is equal to zero. If the machine is not effective, then the difference, the uh, average difference is gonna be zero. The alternative hypothesis is that the exercise machine exercise machine does reduce pulse rates. It does reduce pulse rates. And so the average difference is less than zero. So we have that. That is our, uh, those are our hypotheses. Now looking at the sheet there, you'll probably also notice that the conditions aren't exactly the same. Uh, between this and a one-sample t-test, the only difference is this first assumption, the paired data assumption. What's important is to spend a moment and think about, does this make sense? 
does it make sense to be looking at the differences of these numbers? Because we're not going to always be looking at the differences. We can't just look at the differences. If you have two lists of data that are the same length, that by itself is not enough to do this type of test. We have to have a good reason to be matching this number to this number, and this number to this, and 85 to 81, and 87 to 86, and so on. We have to have a good reason to be pairing these numbers, to be looking at the differences instead of the two lists independently of each other. The reason here, the reason why we're pairing these numbers is because each of them are from a different person. And so that's what we can say, is that the data are paired by subject. And that's pretty much all you need to say about the pair data assumption. You have to have a good reason to be pairing the data. You have to make sure that there's a good reason to be doing that. So the data are paired by subject. Each of these resting pulse rates are from the same person. They're before and after for the same person. So that's why. That's why we're pairing them. That's why we're looking at the differences. So that's how it's going. Now, the random condition, it's important to note here that this is not a random sample. In fact, it says that these were volunteers, 10 men volunteered to test an exercise device. So these are not random. Um, the subjects were not chosen randomly. The subjects were not chosen randomly. So we will have to assume they are representative. Have to assume these results are representative. In other words, that they're typical of everybody else uh, using this machine. Is it correct to make that assumption? We don't know. Honestly, probably not. But we have to do it, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to proceed. The 10% condition, of course, we can verify. Because 10 men are certainly less, are less than 10% of all men who would use this device, who would use the device. So that's satisfied. And then for the nearly normal condition, again, now, keep in mind, we're looking at the differences here. These are the data that we're going to be using. And so these are the data that you would go into your calculator and create a histogram for. So these are the data that we would go in. You would enter them into your list one and create your histogram. Those are the data that we would use. And so we end up with a picture that uh, looks kind of like this. So there then up, and then that one, and then I think your histogram should look something, end up looking something like that. So clearly unimodal and symmetric. So the histogram, or I should say the, di the distribution, the distribution of differences is unimodal and symmetric. Check. And so it's okay to do what we call this is a matched pairs t-test. This is a matched pairs t-test. Why? Because we're matching these in pairs. We are matching pairs of numbers. That's why we call this a matched pairs t-test. It's a t-test, of course, because we're doing means. It's a matched pairs t-test. Once we've verified this and we get into the mechanics phase, everything is as if we were doing a one-sample t-test. D-bar, the average difference. You want to very clearly indicate, and if you want to do X-bar with a little D next to it, very clearly indicate that these are the averages of the differences. It's really important that you clearly indicate with your notation that you're looking at the differences, not one list of data or the other list of data or the means of the differences, 
uh, or the mean, the difference of the means, I should say, we're looking at the mean of the differences. This is the average difference, and in this case, it's negative 2.8, with standard deviation of approximately 2.53. So in our student's T distribution, with nine degrees of, separate of uh, freedom, uh, T distribution, we expect a difference of zero, we have observed a difference of negative 2.8, and so that's our p-value, and so as usual, we have our T-score negative 2.8 minus zero, divided by 2.53 over the square root of 10. None of this is any different than what it was before. None of this should sound uh, unfamiliar to you or should be uh, surprising to you at all. This gives me a difference, uh, or t-score of negative 3.5. And so my p-value is the probability that t with 9 degrees of freedom is less than negative 3.5. Going into your calculator, typing in c t cdf, negative 999 to negative 3.5 with 9 degrees of freedom gives us a p-value of 0 0.0034. Again, of course, don't actually write this as part of your test. I only am writing this here so that you can see it and you know what's going on. None of this is any different. None of this should be surprising to you, hopefully. Um, just, again, be careful about the notation. The notation is the most important part of that. So our p-value of 0 0.0034 is small. We reject the null hypothesis. There is strong or sufficient evidence that this form of exercise can reduce resting pulse rates. We have a low p-value, therefore we reject the null hypothesis, and we can say that the result is significant. And so the last step, of course, is to conduct the matched pairs t interval. Matched pairs t interval. Again, we're using 9 degrees of freedom, so when we are plugging in our values, when we find the critical value for t, we're going to be using uh, nine, 9 degrees of freedom. So in either the inv t program in your TI-84 or the inverse t program in your TI-83, or going online and getting the result, either way or however you get that critical value, you end up with a critical value here of 2.262 times... Um, what was it? 2.53 times 2.53 over the square root of 10. And so doing low end, high end of that, actually performing that calculation, gives me negative 0 0.99 to positive, or no, sorry, negative, uh, negative 4.61. That's a 4, negative 4.61. So we are 95% confident that six weeks of this exercise program can produce a mean reduction in resting pulse rates of between 0 0.99 and 4.61 feeds per minute. There is a statistically significant difference, and it seems to reduce it between 0 0.99 and 4.61 feeds per minute on average. That's, of course, an important word to include there. So again, to recap, for a matched pairs t-test, we have to have a good reason to be matching the pairs. Here, they're matched by individual. They're matched by subject. We find the differences, and it doesn't matter which order you do the differences in as long as you're consistent. So we find the differences. We make our hypotheses about the differences, about the average difference. We make our conditions, talking about why we're pairing the data, random condition, 10% condition, nearly normal condition, about the differences. We make a scram of the differences. And then we find the mean and standard deviation of the differences. We're looking at the differences now. Have our table, or our picture there, t-score, finding the p-value, making our conclusion in context, and then our result there, our confidence interval there.